Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel? We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We're going to pick it up today. 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 11. And we ran into a character, and that's what he was, was a character. His name was Nabal. If you translate Nabal from the Hebrew language, it means dolt or fool. And Nabal was a fool. And we saw in our last lecture that David sent 10 of his men. Uh, it was sheep shearing time, which means it's party time. The wine's flowing. Uh, there, there are a lot of feasts going on. And it's a, a celebration, a time to celebrate and enjoy uh, the fruits of your labors. And David had been, and his men had been kind of watching over the shepherds that cared for Nabal's flocks. Uh, Nabal had a huge flocks. He had 3,000 sheep and 1,000 goats. And we learned in, in uh, verse 2 of this chapter 25. Um, and David sent 10 of his young men to ask Nabal a favor. You know, here we've been watching over your possession. Not one of your sheep has disappeared while we have been in the area and we've been protecting your people from the marauding bands that would come through and steal your possessions. So if you would, uh, and David didn't set a specific number of sheep or goats that he wanted. He just said, if you feel like you, know, you can, uh, please uh, help us out. Well, what did Nabal do? Well, in, in, in verse 10, he said, who is David? Uh, who is the son of Jesse? There be many servants nowadays that break away every man from his master. He was calling David a, a runaway uh, from Saul being his master. Uh, and then and we're going to pick it up today asking that word of wisdom. Let me add though, his wife's name was Abigail. Now, if ever there were a woman who would be qualified, I wish we had more women like Abigail uh, in our government today as ambassadors, uh, perhaps Secretary of State uh, would be a good position for Abigail because she's going to take what was a very difficult situation and she's going to smooth it out uh, to where David is more or less like uh, butter on hot toast in, in Abigail's hands. So. Uh, with that, let's ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. Father, we ask you to open eyes, open ears this day. Uh, we pick it up today, 1 Samuel chapter 25, verse 11, and it reads, uh, Nabal the fool continues his response to David's ten young men. Shall I, Nabal speaking, then take my bread and my water, the Septuagint reads wine on that water, and my flesh put for all meat that I have killed for my shears and give it unto men whom I know not whence they be. I don't even know you, David. I don't know the son of Jesse. I don't know any of you. You guys just get out of here. <clears throat> Nabal is a fool. Verse 12. So David's young men turned their way and went again and came and told him, David, all those sayings. And David is going to lose his cool there, uh, which is not a good thing for the future king of Israel to do. But you notice David's servants didn't argue uh, with Nabal. They didn't beg Nabal. They, they just turned and went to tell David uh, what Nabal's response was. Verse 13, And David said unto his men, Gird ye on every man his sword. And they girded on every man his sword. And David also girded on his sword. 
And there went up after David about 400 men and 200 abode by the stuff. And this was smart to not take all 600 men. You see, they, they had their families with them, uh, wives, daughters, sons. And it's wise to leave some men to protect the home front. Uh, and then only 400 would go, which would be more than enough to uh, take care of Nabal and his. But um, vengeance on Nabal uh, it is something that David should not be doing. Uh, these are future subjects of him. Had Nabal lived, he would have been a subject of King David. But uh, Nabal was foolish in not sharing uh, some of his wealth with David, especially since David and his men had helped protect his wealth from, from thieves in the area. Uh, Nabal would give David nothing. Now David intends to take all, which is not a good thing. Um, this, in chapter 30, uh, when we get there in 1 Samuel, David won't be so wise as to leave some men at Ziklag. He takes all 600 uh, to fight uh, there in, in chapter 30 of 1 Samuel, which was a very foolish thing to do because an enemy came, stole David's wives and the wives of all the other men and everything else they had. If it hadn't been for the intervention of God, they would have lost everything, but uh, God intervened and David got his wives back uh, so did the rest of the men uh, that were with David. Verse 14, But one of the young men, this is one of Nabal's young men, told Abigail, remember that's uh, Nabal's wife, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to salute our master. And he railed on them. This in the Hebrew, the railed on him, is they flew upon them. And remember uh, that Nabal said, who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? Uh, there's a lot of men that uh, uh, run away servants these days. Verse 15. But the men, these are David's ten, were very good unto us. Well, not all of David's men were very good unto the shepherds that worked for Nabal. And we were not hurt. In the Hebrew, this is, we were not shamed. Neither missed we anything as long as we were conversant with them when we were in the fields. They didn't harm us. In fact, is they protected us uh, from those who would do harm to us and steal some of Nabal's possessions. Nabal says he doesn't know David, but we sure do, is what the young man is saying. Verse 16, they were a wall unto us, both by night and day. David's men protected us night and day. All the while we were with them keeping the sheep. And remember, David started off as a shepherd, as a young teenager. And it was ingrained in David to keep up with the sheep, to care for the sheep. And of course, he was a type for the shepherd uh, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse 17. Now therefore know and consider what thou wilt do, for evil is determined against our master, against Nabal, and against all his household, for he is such a son of Belial that a man cannot speak to him. A man of Belial is a lawless person, a wicked person. Person. It even has connotations of, of being satanic, if you will. But uh, this young man was smart, number one. He didn't go and talk to Nabal. He went to Abigail, who has some sense. But what he's saying is, I tried to talk some sense into Nabal, but remember back in, in verse 3, we learned that he was a churlish man. That means that he was cruel. Uh, to his servants even. So the, man, the young man was probably afraid to go to Nabal, but uh, he's saying you can't, you, I, even if I did go to Nabal, I wouldn't be able to reason with him because he's, he's, you can't reason with a, a, a fool. Verse 18, 
Then Abigail made haste and took 200 loaves and two bottles of wine and five sheep ready dressed and five measures of parched corn and an hundred clusters of raisins and 200 cakes of figs and laid them on asses. The repeated use of the word and in that verse is what's known as a uh, polysendenton. And, and it adds emphasis to uh, Abigail's thoughts and the care that she took to, to make things right or try to make things right with David and his men. These clusters of raisins uh, probably would be better translated like cakes uh, of raisins. She's taking a, a very generous peace offering uh, to David and his men. Verse 19, And she said unto her servants, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she told not her husband Nabal, and that was smart of her not to discuss her plans with uh, her foolish husband. He probably would have prevented her from going and that would, David's what his plans are, are to kill every male in the house of Nabal. Uh, if not for the quick thinking and the actions of Abigail, that possibly would have come to pass. But we're going to see God intervene. You see, it wouldn't be uh, fitting for David to murder, which is what it would be doing if he shed innocent blood, uh, Nabal's, the male members of his family and the male servants. Uh, that would not please our Heavenly Father at all. And he's going to, uh, this Abigail uh, intervening here is God's hand in this, verse 20. And it was so, as she rode on the ass, that she came down by the covert of the hill. And behold, David and his men came down against her, and she met them. And somewhat of a topographical uh, depression here, in perhaps a small valley. And uh, Abigail is coming down one side of the valley, and David and his men are coming down the other, meeting in the bottom of the valley. Verse 21. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all this fellow, referring to Nabal, hath in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained unto him, and he hath requited me evil for good. And all I asked him was for a few head of, of livestock so that we could join in with the feast. And David was probably getting low on provisions. And remember, he's got uh, 600 men plus their families. That's a lot of mouths to feed. But he's, he's saying, surely we wasted our time protecting this fool's property. He feels like uh, he's been uh, deceived uh, by Nabal. And he's angry with Nabal, verse 22. <clears throat> so and more also do God unto the enemies of David. If I leave off all that pertain to him by the morning light, any that pisseth against the wall, that's a figure of speech that means uh, any male, uh, as surely, what David's saying here, as surely as God will punish the enemies of David, so am I going to punish Nabal. Verse 23. And when Abigail saw David, she hasted. She, we see a sense of urgency, and, and rightly so. And lighted off the ass, and fell before David on her face, and bowed herself to the ground. Very humble and respectful of David. Uh, quite a contrast to the reception that David's ten young men that he sent to inquire of Nabal received when he said, who is David? Uh, who is the son of Jesse? Uh, quite a contrast between how Nabal reacted to David and, and Abigail. Abigail being completely respectful. Verse 24, and fell at his feet. Uh, Abigail fell at David's feet and said, 
Upon me, my Lord, upon me let this iniquity be, or this guilt be. And let thine handmaid, I pray thee, speak in thine audience. This word audience in the Hebrew is ears. And hear the words of thine handmaid. Listen to me, not to Nabal. And, and she's taking responsibility here for what Nabal did. I think she probably feels, uh, she's hoping that David would be less likely to avenge uh, his anger against a woman than she would against uh, Nabal and every male in Nabal's house. Verse 25, Abigail continues, Let not my Lord, referring to David, I pray thee, regard this man of Belial, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. His name means fool. He is a fool. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, thine handmaid, saw not the young men of my Lord whom thou didst send. I didn't realize that you had sent ten of your young men to ask uh, favor as far as providing some livestock for your men to eat during this time of uh, feast, the, the sheep shearing time. I didn't have a chance uh, to talk uh, to Nabal to try and talk some sense into him when your ten men uh, came to Nabal. I didn't see them. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, seeing the Lord hath withholden thee from coming to shed blood. She's crediting God with intervening and stopping David from shedding innocent blood and from avenging thyself with thine own hand, in other words, by sending me, Abigail, to you. Now let thine enemies and they that seek evil to my Lord, to David, be as Nabal. Let your enemies, David, be as big a fool as, and be as foolish as my husband, Nabal. Now, one thing I want you to learn from this, this chapter is God said, touch not mine anointed. And I've seen it time and time again. Uh, David is God's anointed at this point in time. Uh, so are God's elect. And you see someone try and be, uh, do something evil to one of God's elect or do something to offend, uh, such as bad mouthing them in public or something of that nature. You don't have to avenge that any more than David needed to avenge the insults that Nabal had thrown toward his way. Uh, God's going to take care of it, and God will take care of your enemies as well. As I started to say, you wait three months, six months, and God will avenge his elect. He said, touch not mine anointed, and that's exactly what he means. Verse 27, and now this blessing, this the present, if you will, which thine handmaid hath brought unto my Lord, let it even be given unto the young men that follow my Lord. He sa she saved the gift for last. Now, how in the world could David say no uh, to anything that this woman has said? Uh, she's given him the old one, two, three punch. Uh, first, she humbled herself and showed respect to him. Uh, she called her husband a fool and said, I, if I had been there when you sent your ten men, this probably would have had a different outcome. But then she shared the peace offering with David. Uh, David is going to be smitten by this woman. In fact, is uh, we may not get to it in today's lecture, but definitely in our next lecture, we're going to see that David takes Abigail to wife uh, after Nabal dies. Verse 28, I pray thee, forgive the trespass of thine handmaid, for the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fighteth the battles of the Lord, that's Yahweh, and evil hath not been found in thee all thy days. So don't start now, David, by 
by committing an evil act uh, of killing uh, Nabal and all the males in his house. Abigail, maybe a prophetess, here she said, the Lord will certainly make my Lord a sure house. When we get to 2 Samuel chapter 7, uh, David is uh, lounging in his house of fine cedars and he looks out the window and he sees uh, the Ark of the Covenant uh, under a tent. Uh, and, and he said, you know, I think I'm going to build God a house. And the Lord sent word to David, uh, not since I brought Israel out of Egypt have I asked anyone to make me a house. And you're not going to make me a house. I'm going to build your house uh, and establish it forever. That uh, promise was not only to David, but it was to you and me as well. That promise was Messiah would come through David's seed line. Verse 29, yet or if a man is risen to pursue thee, such as Saul, for example, to seek thy soul, but the soul of my Lord, that's David, shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God, and the souls of thine enemies, them shall he sling out as out of the middle of a sling, out of the cup of a sling, in other words. Now this bundle of life is, uh, uh, you could think of it like a bag, uh, but it, it's, it's a, a metaphor and it means the things placed in a bag for safekeeping. In other words, let your life be kept safely. And notice she, she chose the, the sling here. What was it that David slew Goliath with? It was a sling. He, he took that one stone and nailed uh, Goliath the giant and down uh, he came. Verse 30. And it shall come to pass when the Lord shall have done to my Lord according to all the good that he have spoken concerning thee and shall have appointed thee ruler over Israel. And she's saying here, I know that you're going to be the king of Israel. David's like butter on hot toast at this point. Uh, how long has it been since David said anything? Uh, Abigail's doing all the talking here, and she's uh, speaking the truth, and she's speaking the truth very well. She would make a fine ambassador, uh, just taking a difficult situation and, and making the resolution seem quite simple. Verse 31, that this, this being re referring to uh, forgiving Nabal, shall be no grief unto thee. No, not, a, not cause a stumbling block or a staggering to you. Nor offense of heart unto my Lord, referring to David, either that thou hast shed blood causeless, innocent blood, or that my Lord hath avenged himself. But when the Lord shall have dealt well with my Lord, then remember thine handmaid. How could David argue with anything that, that Abigail has said? How could he possibly still be angry? And David said to Abigail, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which sent thee this day to meet me. David recognized the divine intervention and, and that God was using this woman, Abigail, uh, to cause him uh, from committing an offense against the Lord because shedding innocent blood would not have made God happy. Verse 33, And blessed be thy advice, and blessed be thou, uh, which hast kept me this day from coming to shed blood. You've kept me from committing murder and from avenging myself with mine own hand. David uh, temporarily forgot the proverb of the ancients that he pointed out in chapter 24, verse 13, which basically, I'm paraphrasing, goes, only a wicked man seeks revenge, verse 34. And he was being wicked in seeking revenge 
uh, because of the insults that Nabal uh, made to him and his men. Verse 34. For in very deed, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, which hath kept me back from hurting thee, uh, except thou hast hasted and come to meet me, surely there had not been left unto Nabal by the morning light any that pisseth against the wall. Again, that referring to all males in Nabal's house and the servants. But uh, Abigail uh, used her head uh, and, and her intelligence uh, to uh, talk some sense into David. Verse 35, So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, the food, and said unto her, Go up in peace to thine house. See, I have hearkened to thy voice and have accepted thy person. Uh, you are uh, forgiven of the insult as Nabal is forgiven. Re your requests are granted is what David is saying. And Abigail came to Nabal, back to Carmel, their home, and behold, he held a feast in his house, like the feast of a king, a banquet, and the wine was flowing. And Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Wherefore she told him nothing less or more until the morning light. Uh, Nabal is a fool, but there, and it's, it's terrible talking to a fool, but it's even worse talking to a drunken fool. So uh, she's again showing her wisdom and waiting until he sobers up uh, to tell him what has happened concerning David. Verse 37, But it came to pass in the morning when the wine was gone out of Nabal, he finally uh, sobered up, and his wife had told him these things, that his heart died within him, and he, or it, became as stone. He paralyzed, and it's not uh, certain what is meant by this, but I think it uh, meant that he probably had a stroke. And, and uh, more on that in a moment, we'll continue. Verse 38, And it came to pass about ten days after that the Lord smote Nabal that he died. Now, some scholars think that uh, what she, Abigail, told uh, Nabal about David is what brought on this stroke. I don't think so. Uh, I think uh, the Lord struck Nabal. Again, what was it that David was wanting to do? He was wanting to avenge his anger on Nabal because of the insults. So uh, again, we learn from this that God takes care of the avenging. David's finally going to learn that he doesn't need to avenge everything that, that comes against him that he can let God avenge it for him. <clears throat> There's no question in verse 38, the Lord smote Nabal that he died. I think this was probably uh, a second stroke, uh, and I think the first one was caused by the Lord as well, avenging uh, David, his anointed. 39, and when David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, blessed be the Lord, that hath pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and hath kept his servant, that being David, from evil. For the Lord hath returned the wickedness of Nabal upon his own head. And David sent and communed with Abigail to take her to him to wife. She impressed uh, David with her wisdom uh, and with... Uh, uh, he will marry Abigail, and she bears uh, David, his second uh, son, uh, Keliab. Verse 40. And when the servants of David were come to Abigail, to Carmel, they spake unto her, saying, David sent us unto thee to take thee to him to wife. Well, we learn something from David about David here. Uh, he is not a class A quarter of women. Uh, he didn't go and ask her to be his wife. He sent 
his servants to ask her to be his wife. And of course, Abigail was free to marry at this point, to remarry at this point, because Nabal was dead. And when we get to 2 Samuel, we'll learn that David uh, wasn't so considerate of a Hittite uh, by the name of Uriah, and waiting until Uriah was dead to pursue his wife Bathsheba. And more on that when we get to 2 Samuel, verse 41. And she, this is Abigail, arose and bowed herself on her face to the earth and said, Behold, let thine handmaid be a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. That's her response of saying she accepts David's proposal. And Abigail hasted and arose and rode upon an ass with five damsels of hers that went after her servants uh, at her feet. And she sent, uh, went after the messengers of David and became his wife and uh, followed uh, the David's servants back to their camp. 43. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, Jezreel in the mountains of Judah, Joshua chapter 15, verse 56, will document. And they were also, both of them, his wives. So David has taken two wives while he's on the lamb from Saul. And remember, one of Saul's daughters, Michal, is also his wife. And of course, at this time, uh, it was quite all right for a man to have more than one wife. Verse 44, But Saul had given Michal, his daughter, David's wife, to Falti, the son of Laish, which was of Galim. And this won't stand in 2 Samuel uh, chapter 3. Uh, after Saul's death, we'll see that David demands the return of his wife Michal uh, from Ishbosheth, one of uh, Saul's sons, and he does indeed get Michal back. But uh, Abigail, uh, quite an, a, a, a smooth talker, if you will, an intelligent woman, and she took a situation that could have turned out very badly for Nabal, one, and for David as well, and that he was about to mess up and commit sin against the Lord through the murder of Nabal's servants and, and his male family members as well. Well, when we come back in our next lecture, we're going to see the Ziphites are back at it again and trying to betray David to Saul. We got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word, the world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, the U.S., and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to be answered on the air, feel free to call that number and leave your question. Please don't ask questions about a specific individual, denomination, or organization by name. We try to teach God's Word in a positive format. Throwing out negative about others by name serves no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world and not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite a right to mail your questions in being the point. 
Got a prayer request? We can do away with the telephone number. You don't need a telephone number or a mailing address. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I encourage you to talk to your Father. Let Him know that you love Him. Make a little time each day to spend with Him. You should be able to talk to Him just like He's your flesh Father. That's how close of a relationship you should develop. And speaking of relationships with God, I want you to know that your relationship with your Heavenly Father doesn't depend on Him. He's the same yesterday, he's the same today, he will be the same tomorrow. Your relationship with your Heavenly Father depends on you. I can tell you that your Father loves you. Uh, he may or may not love what you've been doing, but you always can remember and consider there's that repentance that's there for you uh, and you can obtain his forgiveness. Develop your relationship with your Heavenly Father. We do have these prayer requests, Father. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. We ask you to look upon these, Father. You know their needs, uh, marital problems, financial difficulties. You know, Father, if it is your will, a special blessing on each of these. Watch over, guide, direct, touch, heal. And we also lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. Protect them all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. And thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions. See what's on the mind of folks. First up today, we have Linda from Wisconsin. <clears throat> in the book of Amos, uh, in the Old Testament, now thanks for telling me where the book of Amos is, 8th chapter and the 7th verse, 13th verse, to me this prophecy is this prophecy. Future events has not come to pass where it speaks of famine, of God's word not being found. And that's what, you know, you're in Amos chapter 8, verse 11 states that the famine of the end times is not for uh, bread or water, but for hearing the word of God. And the famine is on as we speak. Very few people uh, teaching God's word, very few people studying God's word. I have listened to you, this is Joseph in Pennsylvania, I have listened to you for years now and in the space of one month I have had two questions, uh, this being my second. I also disagree with the rapture theory as I see it being totally contradictory to the word. Noah was kept safe while the wicked were drowned. However, in John chapter 5, 28 and 29, do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. Does this refer to Jesus' resurrection, releasing them? Uh, no, okay, what you're missing is that uh, in 1 Peter chapter 3 verses 18 and 19, uh, after the crucifixion, uh, Jesus went to the prisoners, that's those who were on the wrong side of the gulf in heaven who had passed away before he paid the price on the cross. You see, it would not have been fair for God to judge those who lived under the law with those who lived in, in the dispensation of grace, as we do now, uh, just would not have been fair. So he went and preached the gospel, and that's what he meant. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming which all who, all who are in the graves will hear. And that's what that's talking about is when he went to those prisoners in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. And it states in chapter 4, of 1 Peter that many uh, heard his words and believed. Marie in Missouri, <clears throat> Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2, Then the angel showed me the river of life giving water, sparkling like crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the street on either side of the river, I can tell you don't have a King James Version Bible, the tree of life that produces fruit 12 times a year, once each month the leaves of the trees serve as medicine for the nation. 
nothing or cursed will be found there anymore. Please explain. Well, that is the eternity. Uh, Revelation chapter 21 and 22, the last two chapters uh, of the King James Version Bible are talking about the eternity and the throne uh, is that of God and the Lamb. Um, and, uh, all evil will have been destroyed uh, in the lake of fire, which that occurs in Revelation chapter 20, prior to God's throne descending onto earth, which is the eternity. Emerald from Florida, the food we eat today, some people say the laws were changed when God told Peter to eat all that I put on the table. Are there still laws against pork today? Please explain in detail. Jesus coming did not change the health laws. What was good for human consumption at the time of Moses is still good for human consumption today. What that was going on there in Acts chapter 10 God was teaching Peter a lesson, and what happened was the, the unclean animals were lowered from heaven. Peter was hungry, remember, too, and the Lord said to Peter, rise, kill, and eat. And Peter said, no, Lord, my, nothing unclean has ever passed my lips. And that happened three times. David did not, excuse me, Peter did not uh, partake of any of the unclean animals. If you'll read Acts chapter 10, verse 28, you'll find out what all of that meant. And what God was teaching Peter was not to call any man common or unclean. You see, Cornelius was a Gentile, and Cornelius was on his way to see Peter. And that's what God was teaching was uh, after the crucifixion, uh, the salvation thing is going to be open to everybody, including the Gentiles. Ralph in Texas, please explain forgiveness. Uh, the first verse of the New Testament, it says no forgiveness. I, I don't know what translation of the Bible you have, but uh, the first verse of the New Testament is uh, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, obviously, and it reads, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Nothing is said about no forgiveness. Uh, the New Testament is chock full of references to uh, repentance and forgiveness. Uh, one thing most important to remember is that you have to forgive to be forgiven. And you know, I think most Christians, many Christians, have a problem forgiving themselves. Uh, they're so conscientious that when they do fall short, they, they beat themselves up. I can't believe I did that. And, and they just keep beating themselves up. And I'll tell you, you wanna uh, take the forgiveness that, that the Lord gives you and, and thank him. Don't continue uh, asking forgiveness for the same thing once he's already forgiven you. To do so is to doubt his ability to forgive. Gloria in Ohio, I would like to know why God put man on earth where he knew the devil was. Well, for the most part, man has free will. You see, there was a first earth age and during that period of time, Satan rebelled, and one-third of God's children followed after Satan. Uh, Revelation chapter 12, you can read about that. It's a parenthetical chapter, meaning it's out of place. Uh, but God did not want to destroy the one-third of his children who followed Satan at Satan's rebellion. That's the reason that we are here on earth in the flesh in this, the second earth in heaven age, uh, and God's testing to see, will you follow him or will you follow Satan? You follow Satan, you're going into the lake of fire in the, uh, before the eternity. You're not entering the kingdom of God. Glenda in Tennessee, where in the Bible is it that God said he did not change one iota 
of the food laws. Well, they didn't say he didn't change one iota of the food laws. What he did say was in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verses 17 and 18, and Jesus said there, I didn't come to change one jot or tittle of the law, but to fulfill the law. A jot is equivalent to an English comma, which is just a little bit larger than a period. A tittle uh, is an ornamental dot about the size of a period that changes the sound of the letter E in the Hebrew language. So uh, Jesus didn't come to change any of the law but to fulfill. Didn't change the food laws. The, 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 the same things, again, were good for man to eat at the time of Moses are good for man to eat today. Uh, Mary in Missouri, what is the mark of the beast? I read that God has a mark and that makes Satan angry and Satan has a mark and that makes God angry. Well, I don't know where you read that, but um, order our free introductory offer, which I don't think, Mary, that you have or you wouldn't ask that question. Uh, the CD, the mark of the beast, is free. Uh, the telephone number, the 800 number is free. We don't even ask you to pay for the shipping and handling. It's all free. Uh, it's getting light in the game and you need to know what the mark of the beast is. The mark of the beast is in the mind of those who will be deceived into worshiping Antichrist. Those who have the seal of God in their minds can't be harmed or deceived by the Antichrist and his uh, locust army. Uh, Revelation chapter 9 verse 4 will document. <clears throat> Brenda in Texas, is this in the Bible? We owe restoration to Jesus to the cross for our sins. No, that's not biblical. Uh, what Jesus did on the cross uh, brought salvation to all who would believe on him. He defeated uh, death, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, there is nothing that we can possibly pay Jesus or repay Jesus for what he did on the cross. We are all debtors, but he forgives the debt if we forgive our debtors. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12. Laurel in Mississippi. First, I want to thank you and your father for 25 years of teaching me our father's word. You're welcome. We're glad you enjoy studying. Uh, ever since I began studying, I have had one thing bad after another happen to me. Each time I rebuke Satan and any and all evil uh, from anywhere around me, and it does work. However, it never stops for long. Is there a special prayer I can pray to keep the evil away for a longer period of time? No, Satan uh, doesn't ever take the day off. Uh, Satan never takes a vacation. Uh, what I would recommend, Laurel, is that you uh, fill yourself with Jesus Christ. Uh, it's like the uh, person that, God, that Jesus cleansed, and he told the person, uh, but when he, when he cleansed the person, uh, the evil spirit came back and found the house, the person's body, swept clean. It wasn't filled with Jesus Christ. And he brought uh, seven more spirits and his final state was worse than his first state. So fill yourself with Jesus Christ and the evil spirit, Satan, won't want anything to do with you. They, they don't care much for Jesus because he has power over them. Karen in Kentucky, and you have power over them in his name. Don't forget to use it or Satan will beat you up day in and day out. Karen in Kentucky, I heard Brother Arnold say one time that we are all knocking on the door of the sixth trump. And we knew this because of the four angels. What does this mean and who are the four angels? I think we're getting pretty close to the end of all this insanity. I've never seen anything beat what's happening in this world right now. 
it's unreal, but I know God's still on the throne. And Pastor Arnold was speaking about the four angels of Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 and 2 that are holding uh, the four winds that are also mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, verse 2. And I agree with you, the world is insane right now. It, it seems that people take what's right and turn it upside down and make it wrong. They take what's wrong and turn it upside down and say it's right. And uh, I look forward to the day that Jesus returns to straighten it out, and he's going to. He's got that rod of iron. He's not coming back as a babe in swaddling clothes uh, to be crucified on the cross. He's coming back to make correction. And I say, come, Lord Jesus, come. I think he's the only one who can straighten this mess out. Lucy, is karma biblical? Is karma evil or good? Karma is what those who practice Hinduism and Buddhism believe determines a person's destiny or fate. It is certainly not biblical, and as a Christian, uh, there's no place in my life for it. David, and I don't know where David's from, Pastor Dennis Murray, could you please tell me, tell us what is the Holy Grail, uh, where it is and what it is. Thank you for everything you do. Uh, is there any scripture that pertains to the Holy Grail? The Holy Grail is a medieval legend. Uh, it is not biblical. Linda from Louisiana. Uh, Thank you for your kind comments. I have asked for forgiveness, and I sincerely believe God has forgiven me my sins. However, how do I forgive myself? I still feel guilty about some things. Where in the Bible can I find verses to help me? Matthew uh, chapter 6, verse 14, you have to forgive men of their trespasses, and your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Men includes yourself. Um, Pastor Arnold Murray did a message several years ago entitled Forgiveness. It's CD 30425. And he spends quite a bit of time there talking about uh, forgiving oneself. And it's like I mentioned just a moment ago. It seems that many Christians like to hang on to their sins after they've been forgiven. And that, that has to hurt your father's feelings, knowing what, uh, and Jesus, what he did on the cross, where you can ask for forgiveness and be forgiven. Don't continue to beat yourself up. Let it go. He lets it go, uh, as it states in the book of Acts. Uh, Repent that your sins can be blotted out. That word blotted means like if you took on a chalk on a chalkboard and you wrote your name in chalk and then you took an eraser and erased it. It's gone. It's not there anymore. And that's the same with sin once you've been forgiven. Forgive yourself as well. Gary from Colorado. I recently cut myself off from a person I know who is an extreme atheist. He hates Christianity and God but he indoctrinates his believing children with his atheistic views. It makes him proud that his children are no longer believers. I try not to judge him, but it makes me sick. His insults of God I can't take anymore. I can't stand the guy. Did I do wrong by cutting myself off from this guy? Uh, no. When uh, uh, and you go on to say, I feel my loyalty to God is more important than being around this guy. It really ticks me off when he insults God and Christianity. Makes the martial artist in me want to give a demonstration to him. Well, now, when you're trained in the martial arts, you know that you're held to a higher level of accountability than others. So don't uh, give him a demonstration, as you said. Always protect your credibility. You are quite right, though, to separate yourself from someone who doesn't obey the Word of God. 
Second uh, Thessalonians uh, chapter 3, verse 14 will document that. You separate yourself. Don't uh, just, we'll leave it at that. Robert in Wisconsin, Genesis uh, 44, 2, pertaining to the silver cup. Please explain. Well, uh, Joseph, who had been uh, sold into captivity uh, by his brothers, the patriarchs of Israel, ended up in Egypt. And there was a, a sore famine in the land. The people of Israel were starving to death. And their father, Jacob, sent them into Egypt to buy corn. Uh, they went once and came back. The second time, uh, they had Benjamin with him, which was uh, Joseph's younger brother. Uh, Joseph was testing his brothers there in Genesis 44. He told his servants, put my silver cup in Benjamin's sack. Uh, then when Joseph's men caught up with all the brothers, the test was, would the brothers throw Benjamin under the bus as they had thrown him under the bus, selling him to uh, the, uh, into captivity? Uh, T. Zion, this looks like, I know I'm mispronouncing that, from North Carolina. Who are the Edomites today? Genesis chapter 36, verse 8, Esau is Edom. Uh, Edom means red. Uh, many of the descendants of Esau live in Russia uh, today. And I'm out of time. I want you all to know that I love you a great deal because you enjoy studying God's Word in depth. And you know when Father looks down from heaven and he sees you with the letter that he wrote to you and you're studying it, uh, the Bible, it makes his day. And when you make Father's Day, that opens it up where he can make your day, and that's when the blessings really start flowing in your life. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. One thing most important, though, and it's this, you stay in his word every day. Every day in your Father's Word is a good day, even with trouble, even when things aren't going so well. Do you know why? It's because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645. 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.